uh, we have a few more people uh, getting there, getting, we have some name tags, so in case you don't know somebody, you can say hello to them and pretend like you know their name. <laughs> and um, uh, there's my son that just walked in, came in from BC, and my daughter and my mother, Nancy and Paul Aiken. Paul Aiken here with the red hat is 97. And um, thank you. <laughs> World War II vet. There are not too many of them left around. And um, so uh, it's just a real uh, treat for me to be able to join with you today and talk about one of my favorite adventure stories. A lot of people who are guys like adventure stories. And this is kind of an adventure story of adventure stories. And you may know that my health is a little bit shabby lately. And uh, so that makes it even more uh, a, a nice thing for me to be able to share the story of the pilgrims because it's one of my favorites. And um, so what my hope is uh, that after this next hour that you will be prepared to take the story of the pilgrims to your different families as you celebrate Thanksgiving and you're going to be able to add some little tidbits and spicy thoughts to what people remember of the pilgrims. Because the story of Thanksgiving is much more than just the pilgrims bringing Thanksgiving. They brought much, much more than that. We're going to take a look at that this morning as you journey with the pilgrims across the ocean. Before we do that, I'd like to call your attention to a couple of passages in Scripture that I think are relevant uh, to the overall story of the pilgrims. And the first one is uh, one familiar, particularly to people who are missionaries, and that's in Matthew 28. And it's called the Great Commission, and it's uh, Christ. Christ is uh, giving his last uh, commandments before he beams up to heaven, you know. This is what he's telling all of us to do. This is what we're supposed to do. It says here, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So that is something about what we're supposed to do. Not exactly an easy task. He says, just go and make sure that everybody in all the world follows everything that's what uh, he's commanded us. What's that? Well, it would be in his word, wouldn't it? It would be the Bible. Follow everything that I've commanded. Now, that sounds okay, but of course there's other players. There's powers and principalities of evil and darkness that are going to try to prevent us from doing that. And Lord, how are we supposed to do this? And so I usually think of this verse, uh, the Great Commission, in the context of a second uh, passage of Scripture, and that is 2 Timothy 3.16. These are the only two passages I'll uh, refer to this morning. 2 Timothy 3.16, really, it tells how are you going to do that? You're supposed to go into all the world, make disciples of them all, teaching to obey everything. That means all of Scripture. How do you do it? Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 answers that. So let's take a look at that passage. These passages, as I say, are, are typical of the way the pilgrims thought. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, and particularly 17, so that the man of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This, this is a pretty significant passage. What it's saying is, no matter whatever God created you to do or to be or whatever your future is, whatever that is, thank you, Hannah, my daughter. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. Um, whatever it is, the scripture tells you what the basics, it's a blueprint for you for how you do things. And um, I think the pilgrims understood that to an incredible degree, and that's perhaps in a way how the pilgrims are different than our churches today because they really looked at the Bible more like it was a blueprint. More, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. They were sort of more engineers with their Bible and they would look and see, what does the Bible say about this or this or this? We're starting a new country. How are we going to do it? 
and they'd go to the book to see what the answer would be. And so those two passages, I think, underline to a certain degree the story of the pilgrims. And um, so now, uh, today, we're going to, as I said, go on a journey with a small band. And I'm going to emphasize that there were certain, uh, there's traffic in this classroom. <laughs> you want to get hit by a truck. At the, and they were at critical turning points this small band of people showed an, a courage that's very unusual. I would call them people of courage. And at various critical junctures, there's a turning point in these, uh-oh, excuse me, the boss is here. This is my dear wife, Lulee. Lulee. <laughs> What's the story? Is there anyone here who's signed? Yeah, you're right. Sign is meaning. Well, it's the best. We make a try anyway. Okay, good. Okay, so um, so the, at these critical turning points, you see a, a tremendous courage in the pilgrims, and that courage then translates in these turning points to something that they gave to us beyond thanksgiving, things that were going to be, if you think of it, as great stones that undergird the American civilization that we know, or the U.S. civilization. And so that's why I would think of the pilgrims as more than thanksgiving. And when you leave here today, I want you to have in your mind the fact that there was more than just thanksgiving here. It was a story of courage and of people who dared to use God's word to build something special in the new world. Now, the story... The story starts um, in Scrooby, England. Scrooby, England was where the, the pilgrims had their first church. And um, we've got to kind of identify who the players are. The main player here is John Robinson, the beloved pastor of the pilgrims. But he never came to America. He's a little bit like Moses who couldn't come across into the promised land. But John Robinson had graduated from Cambridge, had a good education, and uh, was well thought of in his day. But John Robinson started reading some writings of a theologian, a Scottish theologian, that made a distinction about 1590 or so. He was writing this stuff, and Robinson read it, and he made a distinction between the fact that church government and civil government were different types of governments. And if you think about it, that doesn't seem to too strange to us because you have Moses and Aaron, right? Both doing their own thing. Aaron kind of doing the worship thing and Moses kind of running the, the civil type operations. And then you also have uh, people like Samuel and Saul. And so there's this pattern of separating church and state. Then you have Uzziah the king who got uppity and decided he was going to offer some incense. And when he did that, he put his hand out because the priests were going to rebuke him for doing something that wasn't his job. And he gets his hand, he pulls it back. It's all leprous. So you see, there was this pattern in the Old Testament of separating civil government and church government, or if you want, church and state. So um, sometimes, for instance, as a politician, some of you would say, well, what about separation of church and state? And I'd say, you know, that's in the Bible, and people about fall off their chair. But you see, the separatists saw that point, and they had this King James in England, and he's not the kind of guy you'd really want running your church. He had some pretty bad habits. And so there was an increased incentive. So John Robinson, he said, I wouldn't dare to put myself in front of these other students from Cambridge that I respected so much. And if, if the Lord hadn't been burning like a fire in my bones, causing me to say, this is the right thing. And so he started a congregation of pilgrims, or are they, we call them pilgrims, but they're separatists, okay? So the separatists, you could think of them as really like an offshoot of the Puritans. The Puritans, the name helps you to remember the difference. 
The Puritans wanted to purify the church in England, which was under King James. And they were a big group of people, a lot of wealthy um, evangelical types that ran businesses and everything. And so they were a bigger group of people. The separatists were a small group of God's Marines. And so John Robinson took people into his congregation. But when the old king heard about this, whoa, he said, I'm going to hurry them out of England. And he started to, to all kinds of regulations and taxes and stuff. And so pretty soon he was doing a pretty good job. And, and Robinson and his congregation decided it was time to go to Holland. And uh, they hired a, a Dutch sea captain to take him across the channel there. And uh, the Dutch sea captain betrayed them. And so the men are on the ship and their wives and kids are in the shore. The British authorities come pick up the wives and kids. It was just a big mess. And eventually, they got the, the church across to Holland. And so they escaped England because of religious persecution and um, started living in Holland. And now, as I mentioned, um, there were a, a couple of key turning points that were based on tremendous courage. And I would say the first one was this. The first turning point was the fact that they would leave their country, that John Robinson would distance himself from the men that he'd studied with and support the idea of separating civil government from church government. And, and these ideas are more than Thanksgiving because today we do the same thing. This church is not funded by the federal government or by the state government. But in Europe, there are still churches that are funded by your tax dollars. So we separate church and civil government in America partly out of the tradition that the pilgrims, oh, thank you, that the pilgrims brought us. So that's like the first turning point. So if you want to remember some little things to check, separation of church government and civil government. Now, that is not what the Supreme Court tried to usher in in the 1900s when they said that you can't make any reference to God in civil government, the, the, the founders would have thought that was a silly idea. And they thought that the, the, the civil government should be Christian and that the church government should be Christian and your family government should be Christian. And uh, you better be a Christian too. And so that was their point of view. So this idea of taking God out of civil government or God out of anything was the furthest things from these people's mind. But it was an organizational difference, and so that was a key thing that they brought. Well, when they got to Holland, they found that life was very hard. They started working 12-hour days, seven days a week, hardly had a time to turn around. And so it was very difficult economically to make their way in Holland. But they didn't complain about it, and they were happy because they could be a little congregation. But over a period of time, and with uh, John Robinson's teaching, they found that... Um, there's some bad things that were going on. One is their kids were picking up the bad habits of some of the other kids in Holland. So from an educational point of view, they're going, hmm, we're not too happy with this. And they started dreaming about something that um, was a big dream. It was the idea of what would happen if you and I were to go and start a Christian civilization a Christian nation, uniquely founded on God's word. How about that idea? Now, that would be a bold thing to do indeed, wouldn't it? And so they got talking about this idea, and they thought about the idea of going to America to plant a plantation, which you and I would call a colony. And um, so they kind of snooped around, and there were some different uh, people that were financing things like that in England. And there was one, uh, one group called the Merchant Adventurers. And so these uh, separatists uh, hooked up with the Merchant Adventurers. And um, it turned out that the uh, Merchant Adventurers uh, said, well, let's go ahead and, and do this thing. And so the group that we call the Pilgrims had about a little over 40 people from John Robinson's congregation that became part of what we call a pilgrim. So when we use the word pilgrim, we need to understand who they were. Some of them were these separatists who were really God's Marine. These are people who I said, 
were willing to take incredible risks and trust God for amazing things. And um, those are the ones that had been trained by Robinson and the other pilgrims who were 105 original on the Mayflower. And it wasn't originally just the Mayflower. So as this deal started to develop, a number of them said, I feel called to go to this new nation, to found this new nation. And so you had men, women, and children volunteering. They're floating in barges down the, um, some of the different canals in Holland. And go ahead and make yourself comfortable. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you, you correct me where I make a mistake. Would you please? Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So the, um, you can picture these barges of the, of the congregation from, uh, from Leiden under John Robinson. They're floating along and you can picture the Dutch windmills turning and uh, the beautiful countryside. And they're making their way to Delfthaven. And at Delfthaven, there is a ship called the Speedwell who is going to take them over to England to meet with the other uh, people that are going to be pilgrims and come across with the Mayflower. And so you can imagine, and this is a time when the majority of the congregation couldn't go. There wasn't enough room in the taxi. And so John Robinson has to stay at home. And he didn't want to. He def definitely wanted to go with his congregation. But he stayed with the larger part back home. And sadly, never did make it across. But he's there on the deck now of the, um, of the Speedwell. And you can imagine he's saying goodbye for the last time to these people that are going to be going. And he's going to give them his best shot, you can bet. And he says, now, and these are his words, he bewailed the state of the Lutherans and the Calvinists. For, saith he, though Luther and Calvin were great men in their days, he was convinced that God had more truth to break forth from his word. Now, was this heretical? No, he's not saying God is adding anything to Scripture. That would be heretical. What he's saying is that we are learning over time how to apply God's word to practical stuff in order to make a better civilization. And so he says, now, when you go over to this new land, be very careful what you adopt as truth, saith he, for it is unlikely that, more or less, Christian civilization should come so rapidly out of such anti-Christian darkness. Now, this guy is basically painting a picture. You guys are going over there, just like the Great Commission. You're going over to plant a new civilization. But here's the danger. You've all grown up in a culture that is anti-Christian. And you're going to have these things that your father and your grandfather did, and they may not be very good. And you have to be careful and look at God's word very carefully and say, is this the right Christian biblical way to do it? So in other words, use your Bible as a blueprint when you get to the new, the new world. And so that was uh, what I would say a key turning point because the first one, the turning point was they left England because they had the courage to stick with the idea of being separatists. The second one is now they're leaving all of European civilization behind and they're coming to this rocky shore. And they didn't know where they were going to exactly. They are going down to Virginia, they thought. And so they're going to try this. So the picture that I have here on my far left is um, a copy of the picture that's in the rotunda in the US Capitol. It's about 10 feet by 20 feet. You could see it a lot better if it were 10 feet by 20 feet. But, it, but we have it hanging up at home because I love the pilgrims. And this is Robinson, who is preaching uh, there in the center of the picture. Uh, instructive uh, of the people who were key to the pil people we call pilgrims, the one who was elected governor was Governor Bradford, a 30-year-old man who was a promising fellow. His parents had died. And also Brewster, Elder Brewster, he was actually a deacon. And he was like their preacher. And uh, Bradford was like the governor of Plymouth Colony. So even though there were only 40-some people from this church in the 105 that came across, their influence, the influence 
of John Robinson was very great indeed. And so the turning point here, I think, is the vision of really just doing what we're told to do in the Great Commission. Go out into all the world and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Are you kidding me? That's a lot of stuff to do. Well, you've got some generations to do it, Lord. And um, so that's, that's what they're wanting to do. So the Speedwell takes off from Delfthaven, a lot of tears shed and farewell goodbyes, um, gets over to England, and they take off, and it's like your family trying to leave for vacation. I mean, <laughs> you know, somebody left the keys at home or somebody forgot their pills, you know. And so the Speedwell, the Speedwell goes to sea, and it starts leaking pretty badly. It has new rigging, but it, the, the caulking is not too good. It's an older ship. So they take it back and finally decide they're going to leave the Speedwell behind, which means more delays, more consolidation. So finally, the group that we call the Pilgrims, 105 of them, end up on board the Mayflower. So the Speedwell in the picture never came across, but it did service up and down the coast for many years thereafter. So now you've got the 105 people in the Mayflower, and um, they start off to sea, but late in the season. And uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what the North Atlantic is like, but it is rough. It's a rough body of water. And as they get out way far away, have you ever been in a boat where you can't see the shore anywhere? You ever been like that? It's kind of like, whoa, you know, I hope this thing isn't leaking too badly. And, and then the first thing happens is what? After you've been in the boat for a couple of days or a day. Oh, yeah. So you got 105. Now this is, these people, I told you, they're God's Marines. They're putting it all on the line. Jamestown, a bunch of rugged guys, you know, you know, pump iron, they're tough. They're going to Jamestown to seek their fortune. Guys, this is men, women, and children. They're putting it all on the line because of this dream they have. And so they're getting seasick. The kids are crying in the hold and everything. I mean, this is not a pretty picture. And you're talking about seven weeks at sea. And so they're getting seasick. After a while, they've gotten used to being seasick. And the sailors are making fun of them. See, the bosun's mate say, use psalm singing puke socks. <laughs> He's really laying it on them, you know. Well, he laid it on him for a little while until all of a sudden he got some strange disease or sickness. He died within a day and they pitched him over. He said, we're going to be feeding you to the fish. He's the first one that was fed to the fish. And so is one of the few people who died on the trip across. As the, uh, as the Mayflower continued, the storms increased in intensity. And um, though they had pretty decent navigation, they knew they were being driven north of Virginia where they were trying to go. And at one particularly critical point, they were, uh, this, the Mayflower is taking a whale of a beating. And you can picture your Christians, what are you going to do? We're going to pray, Lord, you think you could ease up a little on the weather? We've got enough wind to sail this old crate across the ocean. But no, all of a sudden, crack, there's this huge beam underneath the mainmast. And the beam, because of the pressure of the wind, and the waves uh, and the, the structure of the hull, it's cracking this huge oak beam. And um, now the captain of the Mayflower, Jones, Captain Jones, and um, his crew takes a look at this and they go, this is not a good thing to be cracking this big beam on the side of our ship. But they're more than halfway at that point. And so at that time, Brewster remembers his printing press. Brewster was apt to print little things that the king didn't like very well. You know, when he had this printing press, he liked it. See? So he got the printing press and got the jack of the printing press into place under the beam and cranked it up to force the beam back into position. And they decided it was safe to continue. Plus, they still had gone more than halfway anyway. So they continue across the ocean. There was a guy by the name of Howland. And when all the kids were crying and people were sick down below, he says, I'm going, uh, he'd been forbidden to do this. I'm going on deck to get some fresh air. He went on deck and whoosh, a wave just washes him overboard. And he's in the cold North Atlantic, and there's the Mayflower like this above him. He puts his hand up, and a rope comes across his wrist. He grabs it, and the next thing, the, the, um, the rope, he pulls himself, and they pull him back on deck. And he goes back down, and he doesn't stick his head up until they get to the harbor. <laughs> So Howland didn't die, 
but he did get a good washing. Maybe he needed a good cleaning. Who knows? <laughs> um, so they, uh, they continue across and eventually land on the, t on the side of Cape Cod here. I'm going to slip behind you if that's okay, which would be out here. The, they see the side of Cape Cod, and the, the um, people that were there doing their navigation for them knew where they were because there were um, uh, English ships that went up and down the coast and they knew something about the coast of America and they did trading and stuff. And so they knew where they were and they tried to go south because they're trying to get down to uh, basically the harbor for New York. But every time they tried to go, uh, it seemed like the weather wasn't letting them do it. And the Mayflower is a type of ship that will not head into the wind very well. So if the wind's coming this way, the Mayflower pretty much has got to go at right angles to it because of its type of rig. And so they decide after some, so, and there's a lot of, uh, this doesn't show down here, but Nantucket and, uh, and all, uh, there's a lot of sandy shoals which are very dangerous for a ship like the Mayflower. So they decide to go back up around here to this natural tip. You see the wave action brings the sand around and they anchored in Provincetown Harbor. And um, that anchoring, as I told you, the season was late. I, I, we're okay for the wires here. Just step over if you want to. The season is late, and it's November 11th, which was exactly, what, a week ago today. So you can picture what it's like. It's cold on the tip of Cape Cod. And they realize that there is no government uh, document sort of telling them uh, what they're going to do because their charter was for Virginia. And so the uh, Saints, that is the, the uh, Bradford and Brewster and all, decided they needed some form of government. So they did something that was uh, pretty cool. They took their church government. Now, how, how did they make their church? A bunch of free people like us. We say, hey, let's make a church, okay? We don't want King James part of it. You and I, we're going to covenant together to create a, a, a church. They go, okay, let's do that over here. We're going to pick that idea up. We're going to put it over here, and we're going to say a group of free people under God are going to create a civil government. And so they wrote the Mayflower Compact. In ye name of God, amen. And it goes on to say, we do covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, to frame such just and equal laws as might be necessary. Now, what's the big deal here? I'll tell you the big deal. This is another turning point. This is a place where their courage established the whole nature of American civil government. A bunch of waterlogged people on that ship, what they've done is, They've set this powder keg under King George's throne, and 180 years later, the powder's going to go off. Because what's the basic principle of civil government in Europe at this time? King, who said king? King, yeah, good. Get a little better. Who said divine? Normally, I have snicker bars, Andy. You give snicker bars. The divine what? The, the divine right of kings, right? The deal is, I'm the king. When I say jump, you say how high. And that's the way they did government in Europe, okay? What are these people doing? Under God, a group of free people are combining themselves together to create a civil government. Does that sound a little bit like we the people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, this, and actually, what's going on here is more than that because they're not acknowledging the king as sovereign. They're not acknowledging anybody as sovereign except who? God. The War of Independence, 180 years later, the battle cry of the patriots was, no king but King Jesus. And so we, starting from these pilgrims, started with the idea, we don't have any sovereign in this place except for God himself alone. He alone is sovereign. And that's what, Abig that's what uh, uh, John Adams would write to Abigail. We have uh, established the sovereign to who alone, uh, alone all men should be obedient. From the rising to the setting sun, may his kingdom come. That was 
what was written by Adams to his wife after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The idea that God alone is sovereign. And when you saw the, the, the sort of uh, brouhaha about getting Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court, actually, this is a thread of this same theme. It's a question. Is the Supreme Court sovereign? Can they make laws out of thin air? Or do they just call balls and strikes? And Kavanaugh would be in the team that says, no, just balls and strikes because God is sovereign. And the job of the court is simply to interpret the laws that have been created in the country. So this is these ideas that are more than Thanksgiving are carrying down through history, just as Thanksgiving does, OK? We haven't gotten to Thanksgiving yet, but we're getting there. OK. So. This is November 11. Now, from a practical point of view, you guys are like adventure. They pulled out the pieces of a prefabricated boat called the shallop. And the shallop was damaged, of course, coming across the ocean because it got beaten around down in the hold. And they had to patch it up together, which they did out here at Provincetown on the tip of the Cape. When they got it together, this was a, uh, I guess, whatever you want to call it. It was about 30 feet long, and it would take 30 people in it. So it's pretty sort of a clunkery of a, a boat, but it was a lot smaller than the Mayflower. And so the men got on board the shallop. They went and explored, and they found a kettle with, uh, I think, about 24 ears of corn in it, which was a pretty big deal because food was very scarce, and uh, they were happy to find some. And if, the kettle, if that corn were there, it meant it would grow in that climate. And so they took the shallop, and they, they headed on down. And they spent the first night down here at what's called First Encounter Beach, it's a Truro area. And um, uh, in the early hours of the morning, they heard all kinds of howls and yells and everything. And they were going, whoa, what a wake up call this is. Who's got the coffee and donuts, you know? And arrows are coming in that they had some, they piled some driftwood up. And the arrows are flying in and they're grabbing their armor and everything. And the Indians are, are, are launching and oh, it looks like an attack, but the Indians are a little careful because they have these blunderbuss things, you know? And so the Indians keep showering with arrows. And fortunately, nobody was hit with the arrows. So the arrows went through their coats and things that were hanging up. And then uh, they took a pretty good aim at this one guy who looked like the leader. And they shot, and it hit the tree where he was standing. And the bark flew all around his head from the shot. These, I don't think these muskets were too accurate anyway. If, any, if you were in anywhere near, you didn't know where it's going to go. And so. Um, the, the Indian gives a loud whoop and runs back into the woods. And uh, so that was their welcome party by the Narragansetts um, from down here in First Encounter. Then they put off that morning, and they had uh, their coats on and everything because it's cold. And um, the, the spray and stuff coming off the water was starting to freeze onto their clothing. And um, uh, after a while, it starts snowing. Well, the wind came up enough that it broke their steering their rudder, and also messed up their masts some. So now they're out here in Cape Cod Bay, and the snow is thick enough they can't really tell where they are. And if you can see along here, this doesn't look like a very big light blue line, but in places it's very shallow. And you get waves coming in there, and if this shallop gets in there, it's going to dump, the waves are going to break it up, and they're going to be kind of stuck there with uh, no way to get anywhere. And so they, they're going for what's, what you would call Barnstable Harbor. Uh, incorrectly, the people in Cape Cod call it Barnstable Harbor. My father, my father came to Barnstable Harbor. And it was right here. So they're going to come from here to here. But they missed it. As they were coming in, they, the guide thought that he saw where to go. As they brought the shallop in, they realized that that it wasn't an entrance to the harbor at all, but it was just a big sandbar they're coming into. The waves are breaking behind them, and the guy, Clark, who had the steering oar at the last minute between waves, pulled the ship around, I mean the shallop around, he says, if ye be men, pull for your lives. And so they're rowing, and they pull the shallop, and just from the, from the edge of where the waves are breaking, get it out into deeper water. And the snow is coming down, and so they continue around the coast, not having any idea where they're going, until finally, when they're half frozen and have a really uh, had a difficult journey, they seem to be in the lee 
of some land where there's not too much wind and not too much waves, and they pull the shallop up on an island right here, this little one in Plymouth Harbor, and they named it Clark's Island because he said, if ye be men, pull for your lives. And so in the morning on Sunday, they looked around and they found all these important discoveries. They found there was land that had cleared and no sign of any Indians anywhere. A deep water harbor, twice deep enough for the Mayflower to anchor and spend the winter in. And uh, at least four or five very nice springs of clear water coming down off a hill and hillside that could be easily defended and they realized this was a great place to plant a colony. So Bradford and company returns to the Mayflower. Bradford has a sad surprise when he gets back because his wife is gone. He never wrote anything about it in the history of Plymouth Plantation. It's thought that she committed suicide and went over the side. And so the Mayflower comes across to uh, that new location in Plymouth Harbor there and uh, starts the process of trying to put some buildings and things up. So Christmas time, they start their first building, and um, it was, a, it was a, a tough go. Now, you gotta get these people straightened out. The pilgrims were big on bright colors and things. They have you know, red and green, everything. The Puritans were, didn't, they were a little bit more blacks and grays, but the pilgrims, you know, they liked the bright colors and stuff. But Christmas was, uh, it was a bad celebration in England, so they were just decided they're just going to be building their houses on Christmas. And so that's what they're doing. But as this uh, winter comes up, they had what they called the general sickness, and they started to die. In um, December, I believe seven died. In January, about eight. February, about 17 or so. Then 13 in March. Then in the, in the time when they were dying, their women were dying, the children did pretty well. None of the little girls died, and only three of the 13 boys died. And they would take the dead bodies, drag them out, and pile leaves and rocks and logs and things over the bodies as they died. Now, you can imagine if you were one of these little band of Marines and you were a Christian and you thought, this is what God has uh, called us to do, Boy, it seems like it's pretty rough, you know. We got blown off course by storms. They didn't realize the significance of the Mayflower Compact. And so, there they are. And uh, there was a first break came about mid-March, and the cry rang out, Indian coming. Indian coming? You mean Indians? No, Indian coming. And here comes this guy in a loincloth, Big as life, striding down the street, right up to their blockhouse, walks right in and says, Welcome. And they say, uh, or Welcome. Do you have any beer? Were the first words out of his mouth. <laughs> oh, well, um, well, actually, we're out of beer, but we do have some strong water, some brandy. That'll be fine. Roast duck. He didn't say a word to him until he'd finished a good meal. And then he explained what was going on. He said, Here's the deal the Indians that attack you are the Nossets. They don't like white ships and white men and stuff like that because the sea captains will lure their braves on them and sell them into slavery. But this land where you're on is considered um, not sacred, but, but they're afraid because the most warlike tribe in the area, the Pawtuxets, used to inhabit this land, but three years ago, they're totally wiped out by a plague. So there are no more Pawtuxets. The closest tribe or the Wapanoags, and uh, Massasoit is the chieftain of that. We'll ask who he is. Well, his name is Samoset. Samoset's a guy who goes south in the winter, and he's from up in Penobscot, Maine. And, uh, but he had traveled enough with the British that he had a taste for beer and could talk a little bit. A week later, he brings another guy in, the last of the Patuxets, Tishquantum. You know him better as Squanto. And Squanto was, um, the pilgrims called him the, 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 a special instrument of God for their protection. And so it was that Squanto started to teach them how to survive. And uh, you can picture some of you, some of you younger people, um, one of the things they would eat would be eels. And they would catch the eels by taking their shoes off 
and taking their toes and wiggling them around in the mud of the creek and trapping an eel and then bringing it up and they'd fry them up. Oh, they were good. Excellent, excellent eel. Squato taught them also how to plant corn. You've heard the story. They plant the ears of corn and put some little fish around it and the pilgrims were saying, fish? We haven't seen any fish in the last number of months. He said, in another week, you will have more fish than you know what to do with. And so they made fish nets and the uh, alewives were coming down the streams in droves and they harvested these things and put them around the corn so that the corn could grow. And um, so that's the, that's kind of, they, they get things going that way with Squanto. They have a very good summer and uh, good trade and all. Of course, the main trade was with beaver skins is what they found out. And the trading supplies were particularly corn. And so by the time fall came along, they called the first Thanksgiving. Uh, my friend and a congressman for Virginia would say that there was another Thanksgiving that was sooner the Jamestown call, but to me this is the main Thanksgiving. And it's the Pilgrim's Thanksgiving, and they invited some Indians over, Massasoit and a couple of his chiefs, to celebrate. Uh, I was teaching in a public school about 25, 30 years ago, and I was surprised that teachers were saying that Thanksgiving was that the Pilgrims are giving thanks to the Indians. Uh, it was a rewrite of history. It's interesting how that goes. They certainly weren't. They were giving thanks to God. And uh, so they're all of a sudden, a day early, here comes 90 Indians out of the woods for Thanksgiving. And they're going, oh, we, we didn't invite 90, and we don't have enough food for them. Indians arrived with a number of deer, a bunch of wild turkey. And so the Indians contributed to the food. They had some flour left over, so they put berries in the flour and made fruit pies. Uh, they learned a new delicacy of popcorn. And over a three-day period, because the Indians liked a good party, they kept it up with all kinds of wrestling and uh, contests and who could run fastest and foot races and all kinds of things like that. Had a great time. And so that was the first Thanksgiving, and that would be in the fall of 2001. So this is, I mean, 1620, 1621. <laughs> uh, not 2001, excuse me. 16. 1621. And so there, then the, the Thanksgiving is done, and then pretty quickly thereafter, here comes a ship by with 35 passengers with no food or any kind of provisions at all. And these guys go, I mean, you're only talking about 50 some people here, and you're adding 35 to it. That's a whole lot more. And so they had a very, very lean and difficult year, but they didn't have all the people dying at that time, okay? Now, in terms of Thanksgiving, you say, well, that's like these other things the pilgrims gave us. It echoed down, became popular in the colonies. George Washington declared the first day of Thanksgiving nationally to celebrate the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. And Abraham Lincoln chose the Thursday in, uh, uh, what is it, September? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, November, yeah. So that was Lincoln, and after that, it's kind of stayed still. So these different turning points you have. Uh, now, in April of that year was a key turning point, and it's when the captain of the Mayflower, Jones, said, hey, you guys are not looking so good. Almost half of you are dead. You don't have any real supplies. You don't know what you're doing on this stern rock-bound shore. So... Um, I think you ought to get in the Mayflower and come home. And the captain uh, tried to encourage them in every way he could. Half of his crew was dead because of the general sickness. And um, so he uh, gets in the Mayflower and he goes. That was a turning point. And these people decided to stay. 1622, uh, you have um, a time when they're, uh, they make the decision to get rid of part of the contract that the merchant adventurers had imposed on them. It was a condition of doing it, which was sort of an akin to socialism of our day, but not quite because it's a corporation. And they said, everybody has an equal portion, and in seven years, we'll all divide it up equally. Well, it wasn't working worth a hoot, and nobody wanted to go out and weed the cornfields and everything, okay? So Bradford, and among the chiefest of the other of the chief leaders in the colony, said, 
we're going to get rid of this and we're going to give each man his own cornfield, which resulted in a lot of corn being harvested because everybody goes, oh, I got the idea. No worky, no eaty. Okay? And he, and he writes in his diary, as though men were wiser than God. He understood that the Bible, just in the commandment, thou shalt not steal, implies ownership of private property. And so they basically pitched out the sort of socialistic notion that the corporation had imposed on them, and so the colony thrived. So that was, would be another turning point which would uh, generally uh, reflect in our history. There were places where different corporations tried the socialism idea, but it never really caught on because Bradford wrote, uh, not only is men wiser than God, this idea tried in sundry by all of these people who are really hardworking and good people, and it just didn't work essentially is what he said in, the, in Bradford's History of Plymouth Plantation. So now what you've got is these key turning points where the people of incredible courage had started to put these foundation stones in place. Let's just kind of run through them. The first one is separating civil and church governments. That's a big deal. I haven't done that in Europe yet. The second one was the idea uh, that they could actually use the Bible to create a Christian civilization. That was their dream. And it was a dream later of the Puritans, just a few years later. And that was a big dream. And then the, the, the third one, excuse, that was the second one. The third one was the idea of the covenantal view of civil government, a group of free people creating their own civil government to be their servant. That's a big deal. That's the idea of we the people. That was what uh, the whole foundation of American civil government is about. Just like it was a church, a bunch of free people making their church, a bunch of free people making their civil government. And the sovereign, there's nobody sovereign. Is the Supreme Court sovereign? Nope. Is the president sovereign? Nope. Congress sovereign? Nope. We the people sovereign? No, because the republic has a written constitution to make sure that a majority of people don't do bad things. There's only one king. King Jesus is that's what our people fought for, okay? And so, and then you have, of course, Thanksgiving, which is a beautiful tradition to be thankful. And then last of all, recognizing the dangers of the idea of socialism. So all of these things are more than Thanksgiving that the pilgrims brought to us. And so what I would encourage you to do is to think a little bit about yourself, about your family, share some of this with your family, I encourage you to consider that when different trials and challenges come, when the Lord opens your eyes to a turning point in your life, to have the courage as these people had to try to do what's right and what the Bible guides us to do. Because that, that is the, the key of what we're supposed to do in the Great Commission. In the big picture, that's what we're about, is at those turning points to make the right decisions, the courageous decisions. And that's, that's what I'd encourage you to take away from the pilgrims. I want you to think once more about that time. They're on the rocky shoreline in Plymouth Harbor. There are 50 some people standing there. Little boys and little girls too. Not a big supply of food. And they look at the Mayflower. And Jones has told them and warned them to come on the flower, Mayflower with us. And he's giving the commandments. The anchor cable is wound in. The seaweed and barnacles are on the, the hook of the anchor. It comes aboard. Boson gives the commands. The yard arms are squared. The sails are lowered. And the Mayflower catching the wind. It's bow spread out to sea. The sailing out of Plymouth Harbor. The wind is blowing through the pines behind you. And the Mayflower large and then small disappears over the horizon. And this little group of people had the courage to stand there and to lay those foundation stones. If they'd gone back to the Mayflower, all those things would not have been apart the way they were. But in God's providence, he spared Tishquato. He found the one piece of real estate where they could land where there's no hostile Indians. He allowed them to survive the storms, to survive the, uh, the general sickness, 50% of them died almost. In Jamestown, 90% died. All these ways that God watched over this little sparks that were being planted of a new civilization. 
And that's the story of the pilgrims. And uh, I, I read you now a quote to close things up of Governor Bradford. And he was very, very conscious of this. He said, look, as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light kindled here has shown unto many, yea, in some sort, to a whole nation. We have noted these things so that you might see their worth and not negligently lose what your fathers have obtained with so much hardship. Mm -hmm. Governor Bradford, a note to you from the pilgrims. God bless you all. And um, there are plenty of donuts and coffee outside. I think it might be appropriate if you want. Let's do uh, just a few, a minute or two of questions and answers if there's something that I didn't make quite clear or that I got wrong. If you have an answer or a question. What do you think? Yeah. Can you give us a concise breakdown? I know that the pilgrims are not the piercing pain and suffering. Right. But I've taught my children over the years, and I always get those two styles. Okay. The separatists were the ones that wanted to separate from the Church of England, and the separatists were from, uh, that came uh, from the... Um, Hi there, little girl. This is my granddaughter. Uh, the separatists were about 40-some that came from the church in Leiden that were part of the Mayflower of the 105. So they're less than a majority, but the governor and the pastor were both longtime members of the church of Scrooby. So the leadership of the pilgrims was separatist. And some of them were Puritan, uh, just Puritans off the street, and some of them were just pagans off the street. And they refer to themselves as saints and strangers. Uh, the, the strangers are the ones that didn't know the Lord, and the saints did know the Lord, and they make a thing of that when you go on board the Mayflower out there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, questions or answers. It's easy to get those things tangled up. Yeah. Donna. When you talk about the compact, the Mayflower compact, yeah. With the people, and it starts essentially as we the people. Right. Um, this was so well, well, we the people, of course, is a constitution. In ye name of God was Mayflower compact, right? Right. Um, how much of government do they really understand at this point? Well, what they understood was there was no government. It was like Australia. No rules, bait, down under, everybody for himself. And that's the way some of the strangers were talking on board the ship when they found out they'd been blown north. See, they didn't, they were, their charter was for Virginia. Because they were in Massachusetts, the charter didn't apply, so they had no government. So this was just to create a government to create laws so that there would be structure within their civilization. It wasn't too sophisticated, Donna, but it wasn't too long thereafter that you had the whole U.S. Constitution. It was 1638 in Connecticut where you have basically the whole U.S. Constitution written. So it's this very fast time period from the beginning of the idea of the, the, the um, covenantal view of civil government to the full-fledged U.S. Constitution just about uh, on, in Connecticut. Uh, they didn't realize the danger of Massachusetts. The water there, if you drink too much of it, it'll turn you into a liberal. They didn't, they didn't know it. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up? Oh, for sure, yeah. But particularly when they got rid of the idea that everybody owns everything and at seven years they're going to split it all up. Because you're building a house, but it's not really your house. you know. And the women didn't like doing the wash for the other families. I mean, it was just a mess. And, and that's why Bradford gave that the pitch, the heave-ho. Yeah, exactly. Other questions or answers? Question in the front. Question in the front, yeah. I would say so. 
quite a lot different, yes. In many, many different ways. Not in a good way, I think. Perhaps not, no. You know, one of the things people argued um, about, you know, is, well, was America a Christian country, you know? And it reminds me of when I was in college, the kids would argue in the engineering school about what's just better, a Ford or a Chevy? It seemed like such a waste of breath, you know? And the, and the point to me seems to be not so much whether Jefferson was saved or whether Franklin was saved, but rather the institutions that were planted, how close to scripture were they, okay? The idea of a covenantal view of civil government, separating civil government from church government, and uh, the ideas of, of the, the view of, of a Christian civilization. They understood that if you wanted to be free, you needed to basically follow the Ten Commandments, and they understood that. And that's because the founders said things on that basis, that's what gives me, uh, makes me happy. This is a, a, a Christian founded country. The Supreme Court in, um, let's see, it was 1898 said that after looking at thousands of pages of organic documents of America's founding, said it's inescapably a Christian country insofar as the law code would teach, uh, uh, follow the teachings of the capital R, Redeemer of Mankind. So what's critical is, is how did you lay the foundations, not whether or not the eternal destiny of one person's soul. Yeah, like it was a, how oh yeah. Long, how long after was John Winthrop? Before? Winthrop, okay, Winthrop was what we think of as the George Washington of the Puritans. The Puritans were to come in 1628. So the Pilgrims landed 1620, 1628, the Puritans land north of Boston, and um, yeah, everybody, if you got got to get to got to get to the coffee pot or choir or whatever, so you're good to go. The Puritans landed in Salem. They'd had a very very rough voyage, a lot of people dying, and Doctor Fuller from the Pilgrims went up and ministered to them. In 1630, on the Arbella, you have Winthrop who's like the George Washington of the Puritans, and he leads the people from Salem down to Boston, okay? And he's writing the model of Christian charity, which has a lot of the same themes you see in the pilgrims. Thus, remember the famous quote, um, we, have, uh, we have entered into a covenant with God, and by his bringing us safely these shores, he has confirmed the covenant uh, that we might be as a city on a hill, a light to nations all around, but, but people drop it there. It's pretty neat that we're going to be the light on the hill. But what he continues is with the other half of the covenant, but if we are not faithful to him, he'll make us a curse and a byword, that curse and byword, straight language out of a couple of Old Testament books. So that was, that was Winthrop. Okay. Okay, any, well, I guess with time for no, one more question, then we better call it because I can feel the donut spirit moving deeply. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, back row. Todd. The founders would have said the church is supporting the state. Look, if people don't follow the Ten Commandments, the job that the state has to do becomes impossible. The thing gets more and more wobbly and you get more close to tyranny. You need more government as people are not self-governed. So this church was viewed as supporting the state, okay? And so it was a difference in function between what churches do and what civil government does. The Supreme Court twisted it and said, separation of church and state means there shall be a, a wall of separation. That's the Constitution of the USSR, and they're trying to take God out of civil government. Well, you can't take God out of anything. He just doesn't come out of things very well. <laughs> and, um, and so today, the main thing that you're fighting, that the liberals hate, is the idea that your theology drives the quality of the civilization you live in. See, the pilgrims and the Puritans, they understood this. If you follow the Ten Commandments, you got a neighbor, and your neighbor is one pagan guy, okay? 
and, and you somehow are clairvoyant, you know he's going to burn in hell someday. But he's still going to be happier if he lives in a Christian civilization, people who follow the Ten Commandments. Because it's going to be a much better place to live because people aren't knocking each other over the head every day and killing them and all that, you know. And so the, they understood that the civil government's job was to be just as Christian as the church was. It's just a different job. And that's, and that's where the little turn, separation of church and state. It's not freedom from religion, it's freedom for religion. Yeah, yeah. That's a point that a lot of people don't get. Yeah. Hey, you have been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you all so much. Wish you a great and happy Thanksgiving. And um, till the next time, God bless you all. <laughs>